Most people get their knowledge on building muscle from one of a few categories. The strongest guy in the gym who gives out his advice that he's gained from his personal experience across the years of lifting, or from a muscle magazine or website that circulates the same content over and over with just new flashy names. While some of this advice might be helpful, it's usually based off experience and beliefs and not science. That's where research comes in to tell us what's actually worth our time investment, what's possibly wasting our time, or even holding us back. Welcome everybody, I'm Dr. Sam Spinelli with Citizen Athletics, and today we're talking about the science of building muscle. Particularly, we're talking about mechanisms of hypertrophy. 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 This video is a part of our science of training series that we're doing on the research behind training and how it impacts what we do. Now, if you're looking for content on mobility, strength, moving better in general, make sure you subscribe to our channel below. We frequently release new content, so turn on the notifications so you don't miss any. All right, let's talk about building muscle. Whether you're someone who's looking to compete on a bodybuilding stage or just someone who wants to look muscular in a t-shirt, understanding what actually matters is important. For anyone who's tried to gain quality muscle before, it doesn't just happen, it takes effort. Unfortunately for a lot of people, their effort that they put in is misplaced. I'm sure most of us experience that challenging situation where you had to battle your way to get off the couch or struggle your way to get up the dread stairs following a leg day beatdown. It's important we ask ourselves, is this necessary or beneficial for muscle growth? That's where the mechanisms of hypertrophy come in. In our recent video on rest breaks in the Science of Training series, we highlighted that there are three mechanisms of hypertrophy, mechanical tension, muscular damage, and metabolic stress. Now, before we dive into what those are, how we can impact them, and the relevance of training, we first need to discuss what hypertrophy is. The term essentially means bigger muscles. But what's important to know is that there are different kinds of hypertrophy. In fact, there are three main kinds of hypertrophy that we're gonna discuss. That is hyperplasia, myofibrillar hypertrophy, and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. If we consider a muscle fiber that is filled with myofibrils, the things that contract, and the surrounding stuff, then we can start to work off that. Hyperplasia is where we actually increase the number of myofibrils that are in the muscle fiber. We can think of a muscle like a rope. We have an insertion on each side, usually attached to a bone, and if those ends move, it creates tension in its attempts to resist deformation. The bundles of threads are different myofibrils, and in hyperplasia, we add new bundles. Myofibril hypertrophy is where we increase the size of the already present myofibrils, such as making them thicker. Using the rope analogy, we can think of it as where we take a rope and through stimulus, it becomes a thicker rope with the same number of bundles. Technically, through myofibrillar hypertrophy, we could also make it a longer rope, but we're gonna discuss that in a future video. The final form of hypertrophy, sarcoplasmic, is a bit different. If you hang around bodybuilders, at some point, you'll likely hear them talk about doing different techniques to have more full muscles. That's the premise behind sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. As we mentioned, your muscles are made up of myofibrils and other stuff. That other stuff is the sarcoplasm. Proteins, glycogen, water, etc. Now the rope analogy doesn't work so well here, but we can pretend like we have that rope and we try to fill it with even more fluid than it already has. Now, I wouldn't really recommend doing this in real life. It makes quite a mess and just wrecks your rope. But the point is there. Now we do have research indicating that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy occurs. To what level or how we can actually impact it with training, there's a little bit less clarity there in the research. It's important to note that hyperplasia has not been demonstrated in humans. We have seen it occur in different animals, but at this current time, we don't have any substantial evidence proving that it occurs in humans. In general, myofibrillar and sarcoplasmic hypertrophy are occurring together. And in future videos, we're gonna discuss the relevance of how we can impact those things in training. Now, back to those mechanisms. As we stated earlier, researchers identified three main mechanisms of hypertrophy. That is mechanical tension, muscular damage, and metabolic stress. Research is still growing on this topic, but we have a lot that we can work with. In our current updated model of understanding, mechanical tension is the primary driver of hypertrophy. Mechanical tension comes in two main forms, passive and active. You see, when we perform a stretch, we're creating a passive tension in the muscle. In contrast, when we're contracting the muscle, we're creating active tension. We can have both occur at the same time, and this is an important consideration. When most people think of tension and hypertrophy, they're usually thinking of active tension, but we know that passive tension is actually very important too. This is where some old school bodybuilding ideas actually get supported by research. For instance, by changing the angle of the shoulder during different tricep movements, we can challenge the triceps with different degrees of passive and active tension, which may create a slightly different molecular signaling pathway and help us to change and challenge for muscle growth in different ways. Similarly, training at different degrees of range of motion can heavily impact this. When we do partial range bench press, we reduce the amount of passive tension that is exerted on the working muscles. 
However, if we use more load, we may increase the active tension, which could counteract the loss in passive tension. This is an area that we're still learning about as we do see that active and passive tension do encourage slightly different adaptations, but the overall premise is there and it makes sense why we do see a lot of individuals that reduce their range of motion and use more load still create a lot of adaptation. Other factors like effort, speed, and fatigue are gonna impact mechanical tension as well. And those are things that we're gonna cover specifically in future videos. As we transition to muscle damage, things get a little bit less clear. In simplest terms, it used to be believed that more muscle damage encouraged more hypertrophy, but now we know that is not the case. We have a pretty simple analogy that we can utilize. If I punch Broden and rock him in the shoulder and damage his shoulder muscles, he isn't gonna build bigger shoulder muscles from that. You see, when we deliver a blow, it's gonna provide a contusion that is gonna create a compressive force on the muscle and damage it. But that damage that could occur isn't gonna necessarily produce more muscle. And this is where we actually circulate back to mechanical tension because when we provide that compressive force, there's no tension created. Research is emerging showing us that there's a difference between repairing damaged muscle and growing new muscle. You see, we used to believe that eccentrics were more effective than concentrics because they resulted in more muscle damage, which they might, but not necessarily. However, we do know that they result in more tension. This is possibly why we see stretching or isometrics be able to stimulate hypertrophy, yet produce very little muscle damage. Finally, we come to metabolic stress. In our recent video on rest breaks, we discussed metabolic stress because we see that metabolic stress is regulated by factors such as rest break duration and fatigue. At this time, research is shifting away from putting very much emphasis on metabolic stress, instead thinking it as a secondary factor that is associated with the fatigue and impacting the amount of mechanical tension that's experienced. To summarize, mechanical tension is the bee's knees. When it comes to building muscle, it basically all comes back to mechanical tension. As research has improved, most of the concepts around muscular damage and metabolic stress have circulated back to mechanical tension, but this doesn't entirely eliminate them as being factors. With these different mechanisms, we see a cascade of different molecular signaling pathways get encouraged that can help to stimulate muscle growth. As well, muscle protein synthesis is elevated during this process and aids in increasing muscle fiber protein content, which will form new muscle tissue. Right now, we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty details of the biochemistry behind this. For anyone who's interested in that, we'll put research studies below that you can check out. In future videos, we're gonna keep building on the science of training series and discuss other concepts like speed, range of motion, effort, fatigue, and how they're relevant in this conversation. Make sure you subscribe so that you see the rest of the videos to come. For anyone who's looking for a program that's gonna be science-based and help them feel good and move athletic, check out the programs that we got linked in the description box below. Thanks, and see you on the next video. How to build muscle? Ah, lift weights for a long time.